Welcome to the first episode in a Legendarium series about Julius Caesar's invasion of Gaul. In part one, The Road to Bibrecht, we will talk about the differences between Celtic Gaul and the Roman Republic. We will then talk about the rise of Julius Caesar and how he used the migration of the Helvetii as an excuse to begin the conquest of Gaul. Romans and Celts had practically been ancestral enemies since 390 BC, when Gauls under a war chief named Brennus invaded and ransacked the city-state of Rome. In the years since then, Gallic mercenaries had fought alongside Rome's most dangerous enemies, including Ferus and Hannibal. Gaul, what is today France, became an epicenter of Celtic culture. Like the other Celtic nations, Gaul included many kingdoms, each ruled by its own chief or king. Almost 8 million people lived in Gaul, likely making it home to one of the largest Celtic populations in Europe. Roman writers described the Gauls as being tall people with blonde hair who grew mustaches until they covered their mouths. Chiefs of the Gauls constructed grand hill forts, often choosing strategic locations on rivers and coasts. From there, they controlled a vast trade network that included amber from the Baltic coast, silver from Iberia, and wine and gold from the Levant. Not surprisingly, the rulers of these hill forts accumulated fabulous wealth. They wore silks imported from the east, carried swords engraved with elaborate patterns, and wore golden plaques on their shoes, bent so they curled over the toes. Their garments were further decorated with silver and gold embroidery. Of course, all of this wealth needed protection. While some chiefs built hill forts on a modest scale, the grandest kings constructed walls of sun-dried mud brick painted with lime-based paint. The gleaming white walls could be seen for miles around. Within the walls, they built a huge number of smiths, workshops, and warehouses. Almost 5,000 people could live in some of the biggest hill forts, making them both economic hubs and military centers. Some of them included huge ditches around the hill forts about 18 feet deep. While the Celtic migrations took them across Europe to far-flung locations like Poland, modern-day Turkey, and Iberia, they never established a single unified empire. Rather, different groups consolidated under local rulers. When we talk about the Gauls, we do not talk about a unified kingdom, but a common culture shared by many realms spread from the English Channel to northern Italy. These nations were ruled by aristocratic families who elected kings and led the people in war. Though warlike, the Gallic states provided protection for the vulnerable. Children had a responsibility to provide for aged relatives. If they failed to do so, the elder could see to it that his ungrateful offspring would not inherit anything. At the same time, tribal laws protected children against infanticide and being sold into slavery, a common practice in Greece and Rome. Women could also achieve greatness, often as merchants or in the priesthood, and should a man abuse his wife, she could secure an equitable divorce that left her with enough means to provide for herself. Indeed, the term Gaul applied not only to modern-day France, but to northern Italy. However, the Roman Republic had other ideas, gradually expanding their hold on the Italian peninsula up to the Alps, taking southern Gaul. Celtic rule in the north survived for centuries because Rome kept its attention elsewhere, namely in North Africa. They fought a series of three Punic Wars against the Carthaginians that only ended in 146 BC. By 58 BC, Rome had not only won the Punic Wars, but they had also conquered Spain, home to rich silver mines, the islands of the Mediterranean, which were vital to controlling trade, and North Africa, which was a rich source of grain to feed a growing population. While the Romans had shown reluctance to expand northwards, perhaps because of memories of 387 AD, that would soon change. 
In the time of Brennus's sacking of Gaul, Rome used peasant militias that marched as phalanxes, tightly packed together and presenting a hedgehog-like formation of spears. Now they used the iconic Republican Legion, battle-hardened professionals who served for 20 years with no family or home outside the army camp. Officers maintained order with flogging, which could be a death sentence depending on the type of whip used and how many strokes. A scourge whip consisted of long leather strips with little iron balls attached. Ten blows of a scourge whip on a man's back could cut off the skin. Twenty ripped all the flesh off the back ribs, exposing his internal organs. After thirty, it would be possible to see through the man completely, and he would very likely die or already be dead. Needless to say, the Roman legions had an extraordinary level of discipline that allowed them to maintain formations, follow through with battle tactics, and keep shoulder to shoulder with their comrades even when facing appalling odds, as they would many times during Caesar's conquest of Gaul. However, the presence of so many well-organized armies so far from Rome meant that soldiers cared less for the Senate and more for their commanders. It was possible for a commander to embark on his own private war with or without the Senate's blessing. Sometimes that war could very well be against the Senate itself. No commander would achieve greater fame and infamy than Gaius Julius Caesar, a ravenously ambitious politician. Caesar's ambition likely came from the fact that he came from a very prestigious family, but they had fallen on hard times and been shut out of power. Indeed, Caesar was forced to leave Rome and become an exile as a young man. In time, Caesar made himself a trial attorney and joined military campaigns in Iberia. To become more popular with the masses, he borrowed huge amounts of money to throw games in public celebrations. In time, this made him part of Rome's ruling triumvirate, which included the great military commander Pompey, the extraordinarily wealthy Crassus, and now the immensely popular Julius Caesar. In part to pay off his debts, Caesar secured the governorship of three provinces in southern Gaul in 59 BC. This put him in charge of four legions along with Gallic auxiliaries. Caesar found his chance to become a Roman Alexander and coincidentally pay off his creditors when the Celtic Helvetii under Orgatorix began to migrate across the Roman protectorate of Transalpine Gaul. The migration included over 360,000 people led by a Helvetic chieftain named Orgatorix. He was so determined to secure a new home that he ordered his followers to burn their houses back home in modern-day Austria. However, the people accused Orgatorix of becoming a tyrant and he was forced to commit suicide. Command passed to a new chieftain named Divico. When the Helvetii arrived and asked for permission to migrate, Caesar refused. Divico marched anyway, heading towards the Rhone River and Lake Geneva. Caesar arrived first, destroying the bridge across the river. The Helvetii sent another request to Caesar, asking for permission to migrate through Gaul. Of course, Caesar only saw this as an excuse to declare war on all of Gaul and eventually conquer it. So Caesar pretended to think about the question for 15 days. During that time, his soldiers built an earthen embankment across the Rhone River, almost five feet high and lined with upright stakes. With his legion fortified, Caesar flatly denied them access. Some Helvetii tried to cross anyway in small boats, but turned back when the Romans began throwing javelins and shooting arrows at them. Divico turned north, marching through northern Gaul and avoiding Caesar altogether. He celebrated his good fortune by plundering the lands of the Adui, who wrote to Caesar for help. Eager to take this chance, Caesar joyfully accepted and headed north. Caesar caught up with the Helvetii at the river Arar as they tried to cross. Moving across the water on rafts and makeshift boats, the invaders made slow progress. When Caesar arrived, he found a group of Helvetii still waiting to cross on his side of the river. He took them by surprise and assaulted them before they even set up their battle lines. 
With little difficulty, Caesar slaughtered them, and then he crossed the river in one day, while the Helvetii had taken 20 days. Despite this early success, Caesar failed to catch up with Divico, so he stopped briefly at the hill fort of Bibract to resupply. Sensing a chance, the Helvetii hurried to the fort. Caesar had about 20,000 legionaries, while the Helvetii had almost 90,000 men. To make his numbers appear greater, Caesar spread out his men as thinly as he could, and when the Helvetii first charged, the Romans hurled javelins tipped with barbs that stuck in wooden shields and forced the Helvetii to throw away their defense and bunch tightly together, which made them even easier targets for Roman arrows. Twelve hours of hard fighting followed. In the end, Roman discipline held and the Helvetii lines broke. Caesar had lost 4,000 men while the Helvetii lost over 60,000. Of the 368,000 Helvetii who started the migration, only 100,000 remained. Divico wisely surrendered to Caesar and must have wondered if he would be slaughtered or enslaved. Instead, Caesar resettled him in his Alpine homeland to serve as a buffer between him and the Germans. After all, Caesar had further plans. As Caesar settled into his winter camp at Bibracht, word came of war breaking out on the Rhine River. Having shown himself a force in the Gallic theater, Caesar intended to head north to take advantage of the situation. We'll see what happens in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this installment of the Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.